What's good, everybody? Ex Machina here again with another Low Fidelity Dreams podcast episode. Today, we're going to talk about a fun topic of identity crisis. I'm sure that most of you guys have gone through the same thing, but today we're going to talk about it in a little bit of depth on how I've gone through it, how you may go through it honestly, and how you can really avoid doing some major damage to your uh, creative self, let's just say. So yeah, tune in. Let's get to it. So let's talk about my history with identity crisis. So a lot of you guys know that I go under the alias of Ex Machina. My previous alias, or current previous alias, is Rosie Bones. So I go by both, technically, depending on what style of music I play. Now this is kind of tricky for a lot of people, having multiple aliases, but this is kind of normal because once you grow as an artist, whatever encapsulates your style currently is within that alias. But once you grow out of that alias, it starts to shift into something different, or that sound, it starts to shift into something different. And once you get to that point, sometimes it doesn't make sense to actually produce under the same alias. Now this is a normal feeling, and this has happened to me multiple times, right? So let's kind of go back all the way to when I first started producing. My first alias ever was Skydion, and this was when I got into electronic music in 2013, and this was huge for me. I thought that this was the thing that I would stick with for pretty much the rest of my life. Little did I know that I would really change my alias two years after that into something completely ridiculous. Um, I, went, I went under MGBZ, which was Machine Gun Buns. And now, the shift between Skydion and MGBZ was very interesting. So, when I first started producing under Skydion, it was more housey stuff, and it was more experimental beats um, and hip-hop beats. But when I transitioned to MGBZ, it was more of like a fad thing. I wanted to make hype music, hype trap beats, uh, booty tunes, if you will. And honestly, it was quite short-lived. I did maybe productions for about a year, two years on that portion. Let's just say about two years. So it was the first two years was Skydion, second two years was MGBZ. And then I shifted uh, m into a more intimate sound, intimate hip-hop sound, which then I started producing under Rosie Bones. And that went on for a while before I started producing more house and techno music. Now, once I got to the end of my phase of, let's just say, the um, intimate hip-hop beats, I fully started focusing on just techno music, which was under Rosie Bones. And I still produce quite a bit under that, um, but just not a lot of releases currently, but that is still there. I mean, I got the whole emblem tatted on my leg and everything, you know what I mean? Um, so it was a big part of me. When I transitioned from MGBZ to Rosie Bones, it felt like it needed to happen. Like I've outgrown myself, outgrown my production, outgrown quite a bit, right? And this is honestly uh, the, the first moment in my production history that I felt like I took a step forward. And most of the time when you're producing, you know, you're, you're always getting new, new experiences, um, new influences. You're enjoying new artists, new sounds. And so it's never stagnant. You're always moving, right? And we always put our current sound or what we're feeling, our vibe under this alias. And sometimes you, you see that someone has like five, 10 aliases, you know, and it's a lot, honestly, five or 10 is quite a bit maybe too much, really, but I've had my fun with the whole Rosie Bones phase, and I still am, right? But the moment, about a year and a half ago, the moment that I realized that I didn't want to confine myself to what others wanted, what the sound others were looking for, what other people enjoyed, what other people thought were bangers, once I let go of all of that, and I truly wanted to just pursue my sound and sound design, I took a step back, really, and I realized that maybe I could create a side project. Because at this point, this is about uh, maybe four years, five years into producing under Rosie Bones, um, and granted, it, it came with a lot of amazing productions. 
And there's still a ton of them that are online, unreleased, all kinds of stuff, right? I did film score under it, video game score under Rosie Bones, a lot of that stuff. And that was pretty much what my current generation sound was. But a year and a half ago, when I finally let go of the expectations that others held of my music, because it was always about pleasing everybody and making sure I was creating something that was amazing, a banger, you know, and that was, that was my thing. But when I finally realized that none of that mattered to me anymore, that I didn't care and I wanted to do something completely separate away from the record labels that have been putting out my Rosie Bones music and all of that. Because there was a lot of music that was just for other labels, not really self-released, uh, you know, just sending my music out and them promoting my stuff. And it was amazing, but none of it was organic to me. I couldn't feel like I could build a community around my sound because it was almost commercialized and it it to me it just felt so off right and that was when i reached my third identity crisis and this is probably the biggest identity crisis that i i realized and pushed past and i'm honestly glad i did because when ex machina was born it was purely just to create for myself one day i was chilling sitting there editing my photos and i was listening to uh an artist that I truly enjoy, his name is Trashed, and his album that I was listening to, his newest album at the time, was so amazing. I think it was Retro Colors is what the name was. And it was so good, like I had to stop for a second and I was like, damn, what is this? And I mean, I, at this time I've already listened to Lo-Fi for many, many years, but it didn't truly dawn on me that this is maybe what I wanted to make. And so at that point, I realized that I wanted to create a flavor of music that I can enjoy for myself when doing creative activities like editing or even working out if I wanted to, or painting, drawing, whatever it is. I just wanted to create a flavor of music for myself. And when I stopped caring about what everybody liked, everybody wanted, this allowed me to push past all of that. Now, granted, at this time when I started Ex Machina, it wasn't fully realized because my first album that I created, I had high hopes of uh, submitting it to a few lo-fi labels to see if I can get my foot in the door. And really, Dark Lo-Fi Glitch at this time wasn't, um, wasn't fully realized either. And I'll, I'll say that after my first album and the multiple rejections that I got because the sound was either too different or was um, not too sleepy... For lo-fi uh, I really honestly went off the deep end for maybe like two or three months I was like in this weird state of depression I'm like man is this really really what I want and honestly I am so glad that that happened that moment truly was the turning point of my musical career personally because it made me realize that I really didn't give an F about anything that anyone had to say because no matter what if I enjoy the music, someone else will too. And it really, at that moment, dawned on me that this is what I want to create. And now, again, I can't say that I'm going to be producing under Ex Machina for the next 20 years because, again, everything is shifting. Everything is changing. The current me, the current now me, you know, is going to say, yeah, I'm going to be making this for the next 20 years. But who knows what's going to happen in the next five but all I know is I am enjoying the heck out of producing this sound, and this is what my current sound is. This is me. And so after the first handful of rejections, I honestly said, screw it, and that's when I created Distant Ether. Being able to create anything you want, releasing it whenever you want, promoting it the way you want, was honestly the best decision I could make for myself at that time. And I still live by it because I have 100% creative control of my music, which is amazing. A lot of people are always quick to sending their music out to every other label. And even now, when people want to submit to Distant Ether, it's if they want to, but I, I do have like a slight criteria of what I'm looking for because ultimately it's for my own music, right? So I'm not actively looking for anyone to be released on Distant Ether until... I truly realized the sound I'm looking for. And that's what started after this whole journey of creating this indie record label, being able to essentially have 100% creative control over every piece of music that I put out with every bit of promo to wherever I upload it. Like it's all owned by me. And even now, 
with Distant Ether and doing it through DistroKid, every time somebody streams my own music, I get paid for it directly, which is amazing to me. Because even before, when I was sending my stuff out to labels, you would get the occasional you know, chart, a top 100 chart or whatever, but it doesn't really translate to money because the labels will take a bit and then they got to pay for their promo fees, they got to pay for this and that, and then after about a year or two years, they'll send you something, but it's not remotely what you could have if you were to self-release it through DistroKid, for example, and then literally make your money on that. I mean, granted, I had like 10,000 plays, I think, the first year that I started Distant Ether, and I made like 50 bucks, which was way more. I mean, that paid for my DistroKid plan. So totally worth it, being able to just create something and then just releasing it whenever. And creating a record label that's just for you, that's no big deal, right? A lot of people can do that. You can do that. Why don't you do that? And some of the reasoning that some people say is that, yeah, they would rather another entity pay for all the promotion, this or that. But are you really wanting to give up your intellectual property just so that you can make a dollar or two or you can get a bit of, you know, notoriety here or there? Now, it makes sense if you were to create your own music, create a discography that's indie or self-released, and then you were to send out tracks to other labels. That makes sense because now you're grabbing demographics from other labels and bringing it back to your label. But if all you're doing is releasing on other labels, you're not really going to see a big benefit in that for a long time unless you're someone that's a, like super like a superstar or you got like a one-hit wonder or somebody that can get marketed very well and the label puts a lot of money into that. Again, it takes either time or money. With your own label, you can give your time and create something meaningful around your music. And after about a decade at this point of producing music, allow me to get to the point that where I'm at. And I am proud of that because now with this current identity, I have no constraints. I can literally create whatever I want, whenever I want, release it whenever I want, promote it however I want. And there's no deadlines unless I give it to myself, really. And that's the best feeling is being able to create without that stress uh, of having to release something at a certain time or trying to please somebody else or trying to make sure that this song or this EP or this album fits the, you know, the requirements of another label. Maybe make it more sleepy, more boring or more bland, you know, why? Why would you do that? right? Why can't you be true to your sound? Why do you want to make music that is like another label? You know, and that's one of the things that I put on my website is when people want to submit their music to the label, there's only a certain thing, a few things that I look for, you know, like not ear piercing snares, and then also just have a little bit of a glitch element to the track, but otherwise make it original as heck. That's the whole point is to be creative in your own space, but gather other elements of different genres and bring it in to where you can gain that influence. So really, everybody will go through that moment where you feel like everything you've done up until this point was something amazing, but it is like you're about to outgrow it. And when you get to that point, a lot of people will either choose to remove their current discography and then you know start with a new discography on the same alias some people will decide to change their alias altogether and some people actually just produce under the same alias which that might be a smarter move you know for a point if you're a producer and you produce for other people it makes sense but once you start delving into the path of you know the spotify artist pages People will go and listen to your music for a certain sound. And that's why I created Ex Machina, is so I can create a certain flavor of music. Keyword flavor. Certain flavor of music that I can put on and enjoy whenever I want. And so the same thing for you is if you're trying to create a flavor of music, then make sure the flavor is familiar, but also new. Push the boundaries of the flavor. But don't make it a completely different meal altogether. Because when you start doing that, you're going to start getting other people that might not enjoy the other things that you've created, and maybe they might not enjoy some of the 
future things that you create, or some of your old fans might not like the new stuff that you make. So you really just got to find that balance of being able to find that flavor and then expanding on it, right? If I had a boba shop, right? A boba shop has like 20 different flavors, but all of them have boba in it. And so you can take that boba element, that one single element, and then expand upon it, expand upon the flavors, and then create the variety that you're looking for. You know, but if I if I serve steak at a boba shop, it's kind of like, what? It doesn't it doesn't flow right. You know, and most of the time the steak might not even do well there because nobody goes to a boba shop to eat steak. Now I might be wrong, but like damn, do you? So take that with a grain of salt. Enjoy what you're producing now. But just know that where you're at right now might be completely different in a year or two. And if you get to that point and you feel like it's necessary to change your alias because you want to encompass a new sound, a new vibe, a new emotion, you know, go for it. It doesn't mean you have to stop the previous one. It doesn't mean you have to confine your previous alias in a box. But if you truly want to experiment and make something different, go ahead and create a separate alias, right? And then just go 100% in. Promote it 100%. Do everything you can for that alias as an experiment for fun. No seriousness. Literally, no seriousness. Just go in without caring, just for fun, and see where it takes you. Now, give yourself three years after that point, and then you can complain if you've made it anywhere or not. But if you do it for five, six months, bro, it's not going to do anything. Three years. Put that on the timer. Create either... 52 tracks or give yourself three years and then evaluate yourself. Once you get to the 52 tracks, you've then realized if it's worth going forward or changing the game. Thank you everyone for joining me today on this episode. If you guys haven't checked out my YouTube, go ahead and check it out. I've got all my live jams with the SP404 and some modular stuff. It's Ex Machina on YouTube. Also follow me on Instagram, Ex Machina as well. Follow me on Twitter, it's Ex Machina as well. Go ahead and check out my stuff, even on TikTok. Give me a comment, like, subscribe, whatever you got to do. But drop a comment. Let me know that you're there because I appreciate each one of you.